hello students uh, am i visible and audible uh, yes please give a confirmation if i am visible and audible thank you so much for the confirmation uh, dr arushi yes okay uh, extremely sorry for the delay which uh, happened uh, because of the technical glitch there was a small problem to start the live stream so that's the reason why this delay so anyhow uh, welcome uh, to my channel myself dr manjan shinwas i am dermatology faculty from cerebellum academy so in this video we are going to see quickly the important high yield topics the previous year topics in the form of uh, e images and uh, we are going to see the most important possible future question so to whom this particular uh, session is going to be helpful for uh, all those students uh one second i think the slides are not moving okay yes so to whom this session is going to be helpful so all those students uh, who are having the skin topic pending so for those students this is going to be very helpful session so you can cover the dermatology real quick one second i'm just aligning this and also you can revise with me that too very very fast we are going to see real quick the topics uh, which ever were asked uh, in inct and which uh, uh, are having high likelihood to be asked in the coming november 5th inct and also good number of repeats are possible mark my words there are going to be so many topics which are going to be repeated and if you are neat aspirant then uh, you can check out this session now live or you can also watch it uh, uh, later at 2x speed so that you can revise fast and during my class uh, this is going to cover as i have already told you the previous year questions the image based questions and also it is going to be a quick review so what after this session is completed what do you want so only subscribers of this channel can uh, comment so please do subscribe and also like this video and share it to your friends so that it is going to help them uh for the quick revision of the dermatology for inct after the class i am going to provide the annotated uh, pdf so you can download that links are there in the description you can check out the telegram a uh, group in that i am going to share this pdf and you should follow the underlined uh, points are going to be very very important and also don't worry about uh, the background uh, which you are able to see the real exam is also going to have a really um, thick background with uh, uh, words written inct so don't bother you can uh, join my telegram group channel with the help of the above uh, uh, links in the description and uh, this is my youtube channel so i hope you are already watching it so in this session we are going to see a lot of dermatology so just uh, get ready and also importantly failing to plan is planning to fail what does this mean is so if you are uh, right, going to give the exam so you should uh, plan your uh, revisions properly do the revisions and attempt the exam it is going to be a good experience for all of you so this is the first slide we are going to start i hope everyone is with me please do hit that like button yes in the chat section if everyone is ready and we can uh, start this session right now okay 
ओके सो वी आर गोइंग टू सी द लेयर्स ऑफ द स्किन व्हाट आर द लेयर्स सो यू कैन रिमेंबर ऑल दिस लेयर्स विद द हेल्प ऑफ दिस निमोनिक कम लेट्स गेट सनबर्न कम लेट्स गेट सनबर्न दिस इज एक्चुअली अ फेस्ट व्हिच हैपेंस एवरी ईयर इन गोवा so i hope you are also going to get the seat of your choice branch of your choice and uh, go to the goa and uh, uh, have a great party and also call me for that party so with the help of this how can you remember the layers so c stands for stratum corneum stratum corneum l is stratum lucidum next we have stratum granulosum next we have spinosum finally we have stratum basal layer so these are all the layers stratum corneum stratum corneum lucidum granulosum spinosum and stratum basal one more thing stratum basal is also called as stratum germinativum germinativum okay so few points about each of this layer stratum corneum it is a dead layer it is a dead layer just follow what i am highlighting it is a dead layer and there is no nuclei because it is a dead layer there will not be any nuclei in this next is stratum lucidum please remember this is present in palms and the soles and it consists of elidin granules it consists of elidin granules and how can you remember this stratum lucidum has l letter in this and palms and soles also has l alphabet in it okay this is how you can remember and that is the reason why because of the translucent stratum lucidum our palms and soles are comparatively hypo uh, less pigmented when compared to rest of the skin okay next is stratum granulosum as the name suggests th the layer name is stratum granulosum so in this we are going to have certain granules keratohyalin granules keratohyalin granules which is going to produce filaggrin and oddland bodies and we are having oddland bodies next layer is stratum spinosum next layer is stratum spinosum and in this please remember we are going to have maximum keratin synthesis in uh, happening in the epidermis in the stratum spinosum layer and also remember in this layer we have desmosomes we have desmosomes okay and stratum basal it is also called as stratum germinativum why because this is the layer which is going to produce divide and produce all the other layers so there is one question for all of you in a very low birth weight infant stratum corneum is the layer which is going to be under developed okay this is what you can remember in a very low birth weight infant stratum corneum is the layer which is going to be under developed this was a previous year question so please make a note of this and uh, cells of the epidermis please remember we have four types of cells keratinocytes and non keratinocytic cells which are langerhans cells melanocytes and merkel cells quickly we are going to see few important points about each of these cells so please remember langerhans cells they are the antigen presenting cells they are the antigen presenting cells and they are present in stratum spinosum this is very very important it was asked in the previous years in the nsct so this is the cell which is present in the stratum spinosum and its function is it is a antigen presenting cell and you can remember it is having birbeck granules which are having tennis racket shape tennis racket shape and the most specific marker to identify the langerhans cells is cd207 which is also called as langerin which is also called as langerin okay and next we have two cells which are starting with the letter m so merkel cells and melanocytes so i just want you to remember two songs i hope you all have heard this song munni badnam hui darling tere liye and baby ko base pasand hai so what i want all of you to remember is instead of these two songs you can make a remix of this and you can remember munni ko base pasand hai so what is this going to help us so the alphabet m munni the m which you are able to see m ko base pasand hai what does this mean that is melanocytes and merkel cells both are present in the stratum basal okay so i hope you have understood this and you can remember this next we have the origin okay few points about uh, each of the cells which are important for exam so melanocytes they are derived from neural crest and merkel cells they are derived from ectoderm ectoderm 
and this you all know that the melanocytes consist of melanosomes and they are going to produce the melanin pigment and it is associated with malignant melanoma so these are all the points which you uh, might be knowing and merkel cells it is a basically a mechanoreceptor it is a mechanoreceptor and the marker which you need to remember is cytokeratin 20 it is cytokeratin 20 associated with merkel cells so here you are able to see in this image this is a melanocyte this is a melanocyte which is present in the stratum basal and there is one numerical which you need to remember associated with this melanocyte so can you tell me what is this epidermal melanin unit what is the number which you need to remember what is the numerical uh, which is the one melanocyte is going to be associated one melanocyte is going to be associated and it is going to give the melanin pigment to adjacent 36 keratinocytes 36 keratinocytes and this is called as epidermal melanin unit this is called as epidermal melanin unit okay and one more point which you must remember is melanocytes are dendritic cells they are dendritic cells they are dendritic cells okay so next we have important lines Le uh, everyone please uh, he, uh, give a thumbs up in the chat section or in this uh, video so that i will understand that everyone is able to follow please in the chat section uh, do reply whenever i am asking uh, anything okay so the two lines which are important for your examinations are blaschko's lines and langer's lines so blaschko's lines these represent the lines of the uh, pathways of the cells during the embryonic development okay this is very important and you must remember the appearance or uh, the identification features of these lines langer's lines and also blaschko's lines is very important so blaschko's lines first of all remember they are the lines of the embryonic development and they are going to be constant they are going to be constant throughout the life the pattern is going to be the uh, same uh, for the blaschko's lines and you can remember the pattern to be spiral over the skull spiral over the skull and you can see it is linear linear over the extremities over the extremities it is linear and you are able to see over the chest it is s shaped that is anteriorly s shaped and v shape over the back over the back it is v-shaped and one more feature which you must remember is that there is going to be a midline demarcation midline demarcation what does this mean so if you observe the lines the blaschko's lines are not going to cross from right to left and from left to to right so it is going to be having unilaterality that is the lines will not cross the midline that is called as midline demarcation okay so next we have langer's lines langer's lines they are going to follow the orientation of the collagen or the muscles okay these lines are going to follow the collagen bundles or the muscle fibers and they are going to change with age they are not constant they are not going to be constant and what is the importance of langer's lines if when you are going to become a future surgeon so please remember uh, these langer's lines you should give incision along these lines or at least parallel to this line so that you are going to avoid unnecessary keloid formation in the patients and how can you identify these langer's lines very simple so i hope you all know who this person is who this character is this is lord thanos lord thanos so if you observe carefully you are able to say that these lines are present over this portion and exactly similar pattern of lines are present in langer's lines with the help of this you can easily identify langer's lines and differentiate this from blaschko's lines okay and also you can see that the lines are not crossing the midline in blaschko's lines whereas here in langer's lines the lines are crossing the midline so there is no midline demarcation the lines are crossing from right to left and left to right no midline demarcation no midline demarcation okay so next we are going to see 
the vesicular bullous disorders i hope the basics are understood and uh, we are going to now jump into the vesicular bullous disorder so in this you can remember we have vesicles and bullae so vesicles are fluid filled blisters which are less than 1 cm in size and bullae are more than 1 cm in size they are also fluid filled lesions but the size is more than 1 cm so a few more terms which you must remember are erosion and ulcer so these are the secondary lesions which we can see associated with vesicular bullous disorder so erosion is focal or total loss of the epidermis focal or total loss of epidermis and ulcer is loss of the entire epidermis along with that there will be loss of partial or total loss of dermis will also be there so this is the uh, difference between erosion ulcer and why is it important because in Nikolsky sign what is Nikolsky sign we are going to apply a tangential pressure over the skin tangential pressure will be applied over the skin then we are going to see the separation of the upper layers of the epidermis from the lower layers of the dermis so this is what is called as Nikolsky sign and in the Nikolsky sign you can see finally we are going to get a erosion okay and in the pemphigus vulgaris you must remember that there is going to be mucosal which is going to be affected first mucosal involvement is going to be very very important in the case of vesiclobullus disorder which is pemphigus vulgaris so they are their vesiclobullus disorders can have two possibilities one can be intra epidermal split there can be split in the epidermis or there can be split in the sub epidermal portion of the skin so if it is intra epidermal split the roof is going to be very very thin the roof is going to be very thin and so we are going to have a bulla which is flaccid bulla so surface is going to show wrinkling wrinkling will be there sub epidermal split we are going to see thick roof so tense bulla will be there and there will not be any wrinkling the surface is going to be very very tense in the case of sub epidermal split so how can you remember this with the help of uh, I hope you all know this movie Bura Na Mano Holi Hai. This is uh, from sh the movie Shole, the movie Shole. So I hope you all might have seen these balloons. Okay, these balloons are thrown during the holy period, which uh, which are uh, going to consist of uh, the color, the colored water. So with the help of this Bura Na Mano Holi Hai that means don't think bad it is holy pit, holy time so in this what are you able to see the balloons are very very tense so likewise in bullus femphigoid in bullus femphigoid we are going to see we are going to see tense bullet tense bullet so this point is extremely important please make a note of this very very important pempigus vulgaris we are going to see flaccid bulle and bullus femphigoid we are going to see tense bulle okay so in the pempigus vulgaris you are able to see there are erosions there are erosions present almost involving the entire body involving the entire body and if you do a zank smear if you perform a zank smear you are going to see round cells which are having prominent nucleus and perinuclear halo these are called as yes anybody in the chat section if you can answer please uh, put your answer what do you call these cells as what is the name given to these cells yes dr arushi lal or uh, anyone who is watching this uh, session live can please put your answer in the chat section Yes, so these are called as acantholytic cells, acantholytic cells, acantholytic cells, they are also called as zank cells or they are also called as acanthocytes, they are also called as acanthocytes, they are also called as acanthocytes so next we have in the zank smear another cell which is called as multinucleated giant cells which are in short mngcs multinucleated giant cells please remember these uh, cells we are going to see in viral infections 
viral infections and precisely it is herpes simplex viral infection herpes simplex viral infection and uh, you are you are able to say this is the cell which is consisting of multiple nuclei multiple nuclei multiple nuclei okay and multinucleated giant cells are absent they are absent in vesicular bullous disorders they are absent in vesicular bullous disorder so coming to the histopathology histopathology of fempigus vulgaris you can see one very important uh, finding called as row of tombstone appearance row of tombstone appearance can be seen and if you perform a direct immunofluorescence you are going to see a fish net pattern fish net pattern or it is also called as chicken wire pattern chicken wire pattern fish net or chicken wire pattern so now coming to the differences between two types of fempigus that is fempigus foliaceous and fempigus vulgaris please remember both of them are intraepidermal blistering disorders but fempigus foliaceous is going to involve the superficial uh, layers of the epidermis so this is going to be involving the upper epidermis this is going to involve the upper epidermis one second okay upper epidermis whereas in fempigus vulgaris please remember the involvement is going to be of the lower epidermis lower epidermis and in fempigus foliaceous remember f for foliaceous f for first so desmoglein 1 is the antigen against which antibodies can be seen in fempigus foliaceous whereas in fempigus vulgaris please remember desmoglein 3 more than desmoglein 1 are the antigens which are going to have antibodies okay and the level of the split is going to be because the foliaceous the upper layers of the epidermis are affected the split is going to be subcorneal whereas in the fempigus vulgaris it is going to be supra basals and please remember desmoglein 3 is present desmoglein 3 is present in the mucosa desmoglein 3 is present in the mucosa so there is going to be mucosal involvement in fempigus vulgaris there is going to be mucosal involvement in fempigus vulgaris okay and oral lesions are going to be seen in the fempigus vulgaris and oral lesions are absent in fempigus foliaceous very important differentiating feature so you have to remember this oral lesions are present in fempigus vulgaris and they are absent in foliaceous so next we have bullous femphigoid in which we are going to see tense bullae we are going to see tense bullae so are you able to see these are the bullae which are tense consisting of the fluid and this is sub epidermal blistering disorder very very important and one more term which you must remember is settled bulla because the roof is very thick it is not going to be ruptured but it will settle down as the fluid is going to be absorbed back into the body or if, if there is an opening because of some trauma the fluid will go, uh, seep out but the roof is going to settle and this is called as a settled bulla and this is also very important term associated with bullous femphigoid okay and in the bullous femphigoid the direct immunofluorescence finding is going to show a linear pattern and there is going to be deposition of igg along the basement membrane zone giving rise to this linear pattern of fluorescence fluorescence which you are able to see here this is the linear pattern so above we have the epidermis and below we have the dermis okay so coming to the differences between fempigus vulgaris and bullous femphigoid so fempigus vulgaris is a intraepidermal blistering disorder bullous femphigoid is a subepidermal blistering disorder and the target protein of course are desmosomes in the case of fempigus vulgaris and it is hemidesmosomes which are bpag2 and bpag1 in the case of bullous femphigoid okay and the underlying process in the fempigus vulgaris is acantholysis whereas acantholysis is absent in bullous femphigoid very important and the age group is also important so if you look the uh, fempigus vulgaris uh, the uh, age group which are affected are relatively young okay they are not young but relatively when compared to bullous femphigoid where it is 60 to 80 years here it is 40 to 60 years okay and what will be the symptoms uh, in fempigus vulgaris burning sensation 
over the raw areas will be present and whereas in bulla swamp fever please remember tense itchy bullae on red skin can be seen what is this red skin this red skin is actually wheels so wheels can be seen in bulla swamp fever okay so next in the femphigus vulgaris so we can see flaccid bullae whereas in bulla swamp fever we can see tense bullae okay so these we have already seen and nikolsky sign is also one very important differentiating feature nikolsky sign is going to be positive in femphigus vulgaris or in you can remember in any condition where you have acantholysis acantholysis nikolsky sign can be positive in bulla swamp fever it is negative it is absent okay and of course oral lesions can be seen both in the case of femphigus vulgaris and bulla swamp fever but uh, in femphigus vulgaris the mucosa is going to be affected more commonly okay so this is a image where you are able to see excoriations and erosions and few papillo vesicles present over the extensor surfaces and you are able to see a direct immunofluorescence so this is a direct immunofluorescence in which you are able to see the deposition of the fluorescence along the basement membrane zone and also you are able to see in the dermal papilla you are able to see in the dermal papilla and if i will tell you that it is deposition of the iga can you tell me what is the diagnosis what is this patient having uh, in the chat section can you put what is the answer for this question what is the diagnosis which you think of i'll give you one more clue this is associated with gluten sensitive enteropathy gluten sensitive enteropathy gluten sensitive enteropathy so now can you tell me what is the diagnosis what is the answer in this uh, question so if you have thought it as dermatitis herpetiformis you are absolutely correct dermatitis herpetiformis you are absolutely right it is also called as duhring brox disease it is also called as duhring brox disease or duhring's disease okay so there is going to be iga deposition along the basement membrane zone and the dermal papilla in a granular pattern okay granular pattern is the buzzword granular pattern and iga so we are going to mainly see all the buzzwords which you must remember related to the individual conditions okay and uh, this condition is going to improve if we are going to advise the patients to take a gluten free diet which is going to not contain barley rye oats and wheat okay barley rye oats and wheat which you can remember it as bro so these are all these are all the a uh, food which are going to have gluten inside them so patient should avoid them because gluten when it is ingested can cause inflammation both in the gi system and also in the skin okay and the drug of choice for this patients is going to be dapsone please remember the treatment of choice is gluten free diet and the drug of choice is dapsone so next we have mechanobullous disorders please remember these are conditions which are synonymously used we are going to use epidermolysis bullosa epidermolysis bullosa is synonymously used for mechanobullous disorder where we are going to have blisters or bullae followed by just mild mechanical injury please remember there will be small uh, there, there will be a child who is just newborn some form of min minor trauma mechanical injury is going to produce this blisters over the body this is a genetic condition please remember this is a genetic condition and we are having three important varieties of epidermolysis bullosa they are simplex junctional and dystrophica they are epidermolysis bullosa simplex junctional and dystrophica so what will be the clues which are going to be given in the mcq so clues are consanguineous marriage may be given because it is a genetic condition and mother while handling the baby there are lesions which are erosions produced over the body this can be the clues which are given 
uh, in the mcq and please remember this is a genetic condition as i have already told you this is a genetic condition uh, the epidermolysis is bullosa so dif direct immune fluorescence is going to be negative in these patients it is going to be negative and one more thing there is one more entity called as epidermolysis bullosa acquisita acquisita and it is acquired condition it is an acquired condition so we are going to see dif findings in epidermolysis bullosa acquisita this is not a uh, acquisita is not a genetic condition it is an acquired disorder so we can see dif positivity in epidermolysis bullosa acquisita okay so next we are going to see few points about the basement membrane zone we are going to see few points related to the basement membrane zone it is also called as dermo epidermal junction it is also called as dermo epidermal junction and we are having the hemidesmosome complex hemidesmosome complex above so we are uh, we are seeing from above downwards hemidesmosome complex keratin intermediate filaments will be there below this we have lamina lucida below this we have lamina densa and we are going to have sub lamina densa okay sub lamina densa so what is the importance of this just remember keratin 5 and 14 are present in the keratin intermediate filament complex and hemidesmosome complex is going to consist of bpag2 and bpag1 okay and in the lamina lucida we have bpag2 and laminin and in the lamina densa we have laminin and collagen 4 collagen 4 in the sub lamina densa you can remember collagen 7 what is the importance of knowing all this is so if there is any problem with the keratin 5 and 14 genetically then we are going to see epidermolysis bullosa simplex okay which is a genetic condition genetic condition and in the next slide you can see that there are many conditions there are many conditions which are going to have a defect or antibodies against bpg2 you can remember them broadly all the femfigoid uh, uh, dis disorders and also linear igo bullous dermatosis so all these are having antibodies against bpg2 and collagen 7 is going to have antibodies in the case of epidermolysis bullosa acquisita so these are some of the points related to vesicular bullous disorder which you must know so next we are going to see the sexually transmitted disorders so the first one is primary syphilis which is also called as hard shunt so in the uh, sexually transmitted disorders you must remember the characteristics of the ulcer and the characteristics of the lymph node so in primary syphilis we are going to see a genital ulcer which is going to be single and the base is going to be clean and if you try to palpate it is going to have a button hole induration button like induration will be there and the ulcer is basically painless and i will ask you to remember the name of this syphilis as syphilis okay so we are going to see a ulcer and also ulcer and lymphadenopathy both are painless so you can remember the name of syphilis as syphilis okay and there will not be any bleeding on touch of this ulcer and in the secondary syphilis you can remember one very important sign called as buschke ollendorf sign which is bo sign which is called as bo sign in short so simply it is the hyperpigmentation will be present over the palms and also over the soles and if you take a blunt end of the all pin and if you press the lesions hyperpigmented lesions then there is going to be a deep dermal tenderness deep dermal tenderness it is called as bo sign it is called as bo sign it is called as bo sign which is nothing but buschke ollendorf sign which is called as buschke ollendorf sign so in the secondary syphilis we are going to have mucosal lesions we are going to have mucosal lesions so mucus patches can be seen giving rise to snail track ulcer appearance giving rise to snail track ulcer appearance in the mucosa you are able to see this is having a snail track ulcer like uh, appearance Mu these are called as mucus patches these are called as mucus patches so make small steps every day so you may be making some small mistakes right now but you are going to improve definitely 
going forward so the mucosal lesions another term which you must remember very very important it is condyloma lata condyloma lata can be seen in secondary syphilis and lata you can remember lata means flat flat so in the secondary syphilis in the genitalia we can see this moist papules moist papules and plaques moist papules and plaques can be seen this is condyloma lata and there is one more confusing term which is called as condyloma acuminata acuminata please remember this is associated with the condition which is genital warts so condyloma acuminata are genital warts and they are going to have a pointed or rough surface pointed or rough surface pointed or rough surface so these are the anogenital warts which are having this rough or verrucous surface rough or verrucous surface and we can see the description is cauliflower like hypertrophic masses so you are uh, able to see over the coronal sulcus and also over the glans penis there are these rough surface verrucous lesions rough surface verrucous lesions and if the same anogenital warts are having huge size that is if they are giant anogenital warts we are going to use this term buschke lowenstein tumor yes students please try to be active in the chat section please do comment whatever uh, you feel is the answer if you know the uh, answer whatever question i am asking please put your answer in the chat section if you are having any doubts you can put them in the chat section also okay so next we have latent syphilis a few a uh, few points which you must remember is so there will not be any symptoms or signs in the patients in the latent syphilis and the investigation of choice is enzyme immunoassay enzyme immunoassay so in the tertiary syphilis we have gummatous syphilis cardiovascular syphilis and neuro syphilis and neuro syphilis so in the congenital syphilis we have few points which you must remember first thing is that the uh, there is going to be treponema pallidum transmission from the mother to the child so there is not going to be any ulcer phase in the children so ulcer will be absent okay so the treponema pallidum is going to travel and reach the fetus through the blood through the blood okay and in the congenital syphilis you can remember there are early and late congenital syphilis these are the two varieties which you must remember in the early congenital syphilis we are going to see snuffles which is persistent rhinitis which is nothing but persistent rhinitis so there is going to be uh, rhinitis which is uh, described as snuffles and also these children are going to have hepatosplenomegaly hepatosplenomegaly will be there and vesiculobullous lesions will be present over the palms and soles so in this children who are having early congenital syphilis we can see all these features and in the late congenital syphilis we can see hutchinson's teeth hutchinson's teeth and we are going to see hutchinson triad so what is this hutchinson teeth there is going to be notch of upper central incisor so this is called as hutchinson teeth and the rest of the features which we can see are interstitial keratitis can also be seen in this uh, children and also sensory neural hearing loss can also occur so these are the three features forming the hutchinson triad in the late congenital syphilis next we have chancroid 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 is caused by hemophilus ducrei hemophilus ducrei and you can remember hemophilus ducrei these patients are going to cry a lot why because both ulcer and the genital ulcer and the inguinal lymphadenopathy are going to be painful so okay so this is going to be very painful condition both ulcer as well as the lymph node are painful so if you observed carefully primary syphilis hard chancre and the chancroid soft chancre both of them are having different features exactly opposite features uh, uh, are seen in these two conditions so single clean based indurated button like indurated non tender and no bleeding so this was a characteristic of syphilitic ulcer 
whereas exactly opposite that is multiple ulcers will be present over the genitalia and there is going to be a necrotic base and the ulcer is going to be very soft so it is non indurated and it is going to be extremely painful so tender and it is going to very easily bleed on touch you can remember this hemophilus ducre is the organism's name organism name hemophilus so it is going to be blood loving so that is the reason why the ulcer is going to bleed very easily on touch so these are all the characteristics as you can see here multiple ulcers are there multiple ulcers are there there is a necrotic base and it is going to be very soft and there will be undermined edges undermined edges will be seen undermined edges will be seen and the investigation which we are going to do is a gram stain gram stain where we are going to see gram negative coco bacilli gram negative coco bacilli can be seen giving rise to railroad track or school of fish appearance railroad track or school of fish appearance next we have donovanosis which is also called as granuloma inguinal which is also called as granuloma inguinal it is also called as granuloma venereum so gv so if you observe carefully it is not called as lymphogranuloma venereum so that is another condition here it is only called as granuloma venereum because there is no lymph node involvement so there is no lymphadenopathy in this condition so this is only called as granuloma venereum and one more point which you must remember is it is not leishmania donovani which is a causative organism for this condition it is calimatobacter granulomatis or klebsiella granulomatis okay and in the donor venosis uh, if you look at the description of the genital ulcer it is very very characteristic it is called as beefy red painless ulcer beefy red painless ulcer will be seen which will bleed very very easily on touch which will bleed very very easily on touch and there is one more term which you must remember related to donor venosis on gym sustain we are going to see safety pin appearance very important we are going to see what is called as a safety pin appearance safety pin appearance so coming to lgv lymphogranuloma venereum the causative organism is chlamydia trachomatis and we are going to see a very peculiar aspect in lgv where this is genital ulcer disease which may not have which may not present with a genital ulcer in the patients so no ulcer no ulcer can be a very characteristic of lymphogranuloma venereum and this is going to be very painless or transient ulcer that is the reason why patient is not going to uh, experience the ulcer it can go unnoticed by the patients and you can remember that the inguinal lymphadenopathy which we have seen in chancroid it is called as a bubo it is called as a bubo and uh, lgv in lgv also we can see the presence of the bubo bubo is nothing but the inguinal lymph node which is enlarged and associated with pus so suppurative inguinal lymphadenopathy is called as a bubo okay and in the case of chancroid please remember the patients are going to have genital ulcers along with the lymphadenopathy whereas in lgv the genital ulcer is absent so concomitant ulcer is absent in the case of lymphogranuloma venereum in the case of lymphogranuloma venereum and in the the lymphogranuloma venereum lg we can see three stages the primary stage the genital ulcer this the second stage you can remember the inguinal stage here we are going to see when very important finding which is called as groove sign of grenblatt groove sign of grenblatt because of the enlarged lymph nodes uh, above and below the inguinal ligament we are going to have the elevations of the skin on both the sides whereas in between we are going to see a groove we are going to see a groove so this is what is called as a groove sign of grenblatt which we can see in lgv okay just remember rgv with the help of which you can remember the features of lgv few features of lgv very easily so just imagine that uh, rgv uh, is a director uh, i hope you all know so just imagine that he is holding this saxophone just imagine that he is holding this saxophone okay so in lgv why am i telling you this is because in the tertiary stage we are going to have the destruction or deformities of the genitalia deformities of the genitalia due to the involvement of the lymph nodes due to the obstruction of the lymph nodes so 
we are going to see this saxophone penis and we are going to see esthamin esthamin in the woman so basically in this genital deformities will be present so now coming to the genital ulcers are completed now we are going to see few points related to discharge so first one is gonococcal urethritis gonococcal urethritis second yes so gonococcal urethritis few points so it is causative organism is Neisseria gonorrhea and in non gonococcal urethritis you can remember there are various causes but chlamydia trachomatis is the important one apart from this mycoplasma urea plasma trichomonas can also be causative agents in the gonococcal urethritis this constitutional symptoms are going to be very very severe and also there is going to be severe dysuria in the patients and there is going to be profuse purulent profuse purulent urethral discharge in these patients and in the non gonococcal urethritis the patients are hardly going to have any symptoms dysuria will also be very mild and the discharge is going to be scanty and mucoid in nature scanty and mucoid in nature one very important image which you must remember so dermatology and microbiology we can see integration gonococcal erythritis there is going to be presence of intracellular diplococci intracellular diplococci present inside the pmnl polymorphonuclear leukocytes we are going to see these diplococci which are gram negative in nature so because this is causative agent is Neisseria gonorrhea so we are going to see gram negative diplococci present inside the PMNL non, in non gonococcal urethritis we are not going to see any such finding so you can uh, briefly remember with the help of this trick few important points so syphilis we are going to have a painless ulcer and lymphadenopathy painless ulcer and lymphadenopathy and in the do no vanosis, remember do no do no is two no's okay two no's one no is that no lymphadenopathy which i have already told you and the another no is no pain in the ulcer so do no vanosis, ulcer may look very dangerous red beefy very easily bleeds on touch but still there is no pain in the ulcer of donor venosis okay so coming to the approach to genital ulcer disease so whenever you see a patient who is having genital ulcer uh, and lymphadenopathy you should always think about uh, this flow chart or uh, which i am telling with the help of which you can easily come to a conclusion so if the patient is having multiple painful genital ulcer if the patient is having multiple painful genital ulcers examine the lymph nodes examine the lymph nodes and on examination of the lymph node genital uh, inguinal lymph nodes if you are able to see that the lymph nodes are enlarged bilaterally enlarged bilaterally without any bubo that is there is no separation then our answer then our answer this condition is going to be yes can anyone put your answer in the chat uh, or comment section yes uh, if you are able to answer this question please put your uh, cor uh, uh, correct answer in the comments please yes so this is this is our herpes herpes simplex viral infection is going to be the answer in this case and in the patient is present with multiple painful genital ulcers and if you observe the lymph node if it is having enlargement unilaterally and if there is suppuration present in the lymphadenopathy which is called as a bubo then our answer our diagnosis is going to be chancroid our diagnosis is going to be chancroid now coming to the single painless ulcers if the single painless ulcer is present examine the lymph node if the lymphadenopathy is absent if the examiner mentioned the lymphadenopathy is absent then our answer is going to be do no vanosis do no vanosis and if there is lymphadenopathy bilaterally and if it is painless in nature then the answer is going to be syphilis 
then the answer is going to be syphilis and if there is lymphadenopathy and if there is a painful bubo present in the inguinal area then the answer is going to be lymphogranuloma venerum lymphogranuloma venerum so this is how you can uh, easily diagnose the genital ulcer disorders genital ulcer disorder so few uh, points a quick review we can say of the genital ulcer disorders so syphilis remember it is going to be button hole induration which will be present a single ulcer will be seen which will have a clean base button hole and there is going to be shorty lymphadenopathy coming to herpes we can see vesicles vesicles and there will be a mention of recurrent nature of the lesions and predominantly the lesions are erosions instead of ulcers there will be mention of erosions in the case of herpes and lymphadenopathy is also going to be tender in herpes coming to chancroid remember there will be undermined ragged ulcers present and there is going to be purulent dirty base of the ulcer and there is going to be bubo which is seen in the patients of chancroid in the patients of chancroid we can see this bubo and in lgv we can see bubos the same bubos can be seen in lgv also coming to donovanosis red beefy ulcer is the characteristic description of donovanosis now coming to herpes simplex viral infection so you can remember hsv1 is associated it is called as orolabial herpes and it is also called as fever blister or cold sores cold sores and we are going to see multiple grouped vesicles near the lip margin as you are able to see multiple grouped vesicles present in a uh, near the lips near the lips next is erythema multiforme erythema multiforme the lesion which you are going to see is called as target lesion target lesion it is also called as bull's eye lesion or it is also called as iris lesion it is also called as iris lesion okay and hsv2 so it is going to produce genital lesions genital lesions and which are going to be initially vesicles but they are going to ultimately rupture and going they are going to form erosions which are going to fuse together to form polycyclic polycyclic erosions polycyclic erosions so few points related to target lesions remember target lesions are caused by the most important most common causes herpes simplex viral infection for erith uh, the target lesions which are seen in erythema multiforme which are seen in erythema multiforme and the lesions are going to be predominantly seen over the palms and soles the lesions are going to be predominantly seen over the palms and soles and there will be history of recurrent oral and genital ulcers or blisters so these are the classical points which will be given in the history coming to the bacterial infections bacterial infection which is non bullous impetigo and bullous impetigo remember non bullous impetigo is the most common form of impetigo which is also called as impetigo contagiosa bullous impetigo is not so much common when compared to the non bullous impetigo and the causative agent in bullous impetigo and non bullous impetigo is also different in bullous impetigo please remember it is only and only staphylococcus it is only staphylococcus which is going to cause is bullous impetigo whereas non bullous impetigo the causative agent can be strep that is group a beta amyloid streptococcus as well as staphylococcus aureus as well as staphylococcus aureus and in the case of bullous impetigo remember there is going to be a toxin associated which is called as exfoliative toxin which is called as exfoliative toxin so they because streptococcus is associated in non bullous impetigo so there can be a possible complication which is called as post streptococcal glomerulonephritis post streptococcal glomerulonephritis is a possible complication in non bullous or impetigo contagiosa in bullous impetigo remember the patients the children can have staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome so basically sssss it is a distant uh, they uh, it is basically a blistering uh, disease which is seen in children which is seen in children where there is going to be history of a distant infection distant focus of infection will be there in the form of conjunctivitis otitis media or even bullous impetigo where the child is going to present with 
constitutional symptoms and the basic problem in the staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome is the that the staph aureus which is producing the exfoliative toxin or epidermolytic toxin this is going to uh, spread through the blood that is hematogenously th this is going to spread and this is going to target the skin and this is going to specifically target the desmoglein 1 in the desmosomes desmoglein 1 which is present in the upper epidermis so there is going to be a subcorneal split so if you remember desmoglein first desmoglein 1 was having antibodies against in the case of femphigus vulgaris sorry i am sorry femphigus foliaceus okay sorry for that so femphigus foliaceus f for foliaceus f for first desmoglein 1 okay so similarly here there is going to be damage of the desmoglein 1 because of the toxin so here the damage is due to toxin but not the antibodies so then what will happen now how does it manifest there is going to be true nikolsky and positive so if we uh, apply tangential pressure over the skin there is going to be peeling off of the upper layers of the epidermis from the below layers of the dermis and in the skin you are able to see there is redness that is erythema will be present erythema will be seen and there is peeling off of the skin peeling off of, of the skin will be seen and if you see the next image you can clearly see the Nikolsky sign beautiful uh, Nikolsky sign can be seen so please remember wherever there is acantholysis we can see this Nikolsky sign okay acantholysis will be seen in the staphylococcal scarlet skin syndrome also and you are able to see because it is desmoglein 1 which is having uh, affect, uh, affected have, uh, having affected here in this case so mucosa will be normal mucosa will be absolutely normal mucosa will be absolutely normal okay so now coming to the infections which are deeper down when compared to impetigo they are erysipelas and cellulitis so here the examiner can give you that a uh, adult male patient coming with red lesions over the body erythematous lesions over the body associated with fever and other constitutional symptoms so the two possibilities which can be thought of or erysipelas and cellulitis so in the erysipelas just remember it is also called a saint anthony's fire saint anthony's fire and here the involvement is basically upper half of the dermis along with lymphatics whereas cellulitis is a deeper involvement even subcutaneous tissues can also be infected and the causative organisms are interesting here it is erysipelas produced only because of group a beta amyloid streptococcus whereas cellulitis can be due to strep as well as staph so in erysipelas we are going to see well defined well defined margins you can easily differentiate between the lesional skin and the normal skin in erysipelas so this is a patient of erysipelas whereas in cellulitis the borders the edges are going to be very very ill defined very very ill defined and there is going to be diffuse spread in the case of cellulitis so now coming to scrub typhus now coming to scrub typhus uh, remember uh, very important uh, previous uh, year question of NICT patients are going to present uh, to the casualty with the complaints of CNS and if you observe closely over the skin there is going to be a lesion which is described as an S char which is described as an S char which is basically a black scab which is surrounded by a red erythema so this is the black scab which you are able to see which is surrounded by this erythema this is not only seen in scrub typhus but we can also see this s char formation very important it can also be seen in cutaneous anthrax spider bite brown recluse spider bite of course scrub typhus and can anyone tell me in which uh, condition do we not see this s char it was a previous year question so please remember Kazanur forest disease in this condition we are not going to see any s char we are not going to see any s char very important for you to remember now coming to the hair okay uh, one term which you must remember uh, in hair uh, structure is 
Huxley and Henley layers. So Huxley and Henley layers are part of the hair. Are part of the hair. So we have non-cicatricial alopecia and cicatricial alopecia. So non-cicatricial simply means the hair is going to regrow. Whereas uh, in uh, the cicatricial alopecia, the hair loss is permanent. So non-cicatricial, just remember we have various patterns. In that patch is very very important. Uh, the other ones are also important. In the diffuse one, effluvium, which can be anagen effluvium or telogen effluvium. In the pattern, we have androgenetic alopecia, and in the systemic, we have systemic lupus erythematosus. Okay. In the patchy, remember we have alopecia areata, trichotillomania, tinea capitis, which is non-inflammatory variety, and secondary syphilis. So these are all very very important causes. We are going to see briefly few points related to each of them. So in the alopecia areata, remember there will be circular areas of complete hair loss. So these points which are in underline are very important. Circular areas of complete hair loss will be there, and there is going to be no inflammatory changes. No inflammation will be there. Uh, in these patches so if you see this is a patch which is having complete hair loss and there is one classical uh, descriptive term used in the histopath of this alopecia areata which is called as swarm of bees appearance which is called as swarm of bees appearance due to the peribulbar lymphocytic infiltrate peri peribulbar lymphocytic infiltrate will be there because this alopecia areata is a autoimmune condition due to the lymphocytes there is going to be damage to the hair bulb hair bulb that is the reason why the distal part of the hair the distal part of the hair is going to be broad when compared to the proximal portion proximal portion of the hair so giving rise to one very important finding which is called as exclamation mark hair giving rise to what is called as an exclamation mark here exclamation mark here and alopecia areata is going to have few nail changes which are very very important what are those nail changes so we are going to see regular uh, pits pits which are going to be regular and they are very superficial and they are present in a geometric fashion so this is exactly opposite to that of the nail changes which are going to see in psoriasis so in psoriasis we are going to see pitting off of the nails and this pitting is described you can remember it as dic where d stands for deep i stands for irregular and c stands for coarse so deep irregular coarse pits will be seen over the nails in psoriasis patients as opposed to the alopecia areata so treatment of alopecia areata is we are going to inject these steroids into the lesion intralesionally giving steroids is the treatment localized disease ils will be the treatment and uh, yes you can remember the next condition anagen effluvium anagen effluvium please remember effluvium here stands for shedding or fall anagen uh, effluvium is the term which is used whenever the patients are started on chemotherapy the anagen hair follicles they are going to be damaged they are going to be damaged and they are going to just be lost from the uh, patient's body so the anagen hair follicles which are going to contribute almost 80% of the of the hair over the body if they are lost what will happen the patient is going to appear almost uh, bald so this is called as anagen effluvium and this is seen in the individuals who underwent any chemotherapy or radiotherapy most likely okay these two are the legends who underwent the cancer chemotherapy okay i hope you all know next is telogen effluvium okay in this uh, you can remember when if there is any major stress like for example pregnancy after pregnancy or after uh, stressful uh, myocardial infarction or any hospital admission or a surgery or even the exams which you are going through so after any of the stressful conditions the patient's hair is going to fall after a period of 3 months after a period of 3 months so what is this basically happening there is a premature entry of the anagen hair 
anagen hair will enter into the telogen hair abruptly because of which there is going to be loss of the hair telogen phase hair is going to stay for a period of 3 months so after 3 months there is going to be a hair loss this is called as this is called as telogen effluvium and why is it important uh, the covid 19 has caused so many patients to get telogen effluvium so this can be a future mcq so next we are going to see appendages skin appendages so the thing which you must remember is the fox for this disease and for the spots the differentiation between these two is very important it was asked so many times so please remember this sebaceous glands they are usually present associated with the hair, hair follicles but if they are opening onto the skin surface without any association with the hair follicles we call them as ectopic sebaceous glands that is there is no association with the hair follicle there is no association with the hair follicle and we can see that these uh, ectopic sebaceous glands can be present in various uh, areas of the body okay so if the ectopic sebaceous glands are present over the buccal uh, mucosa or upper lip we are going to call it as for this spots we are going to call it as for this spots and it is going to present as yellow micropapules yellow micropapules and uh, the other ectopic sebaceous glands which you must remember are montgomery tubercles over the breast meibomian glands over the eyelids and tyson's glands which are present over the prepuce tyson these are all the ectopic sebaceous glands which you must remember and the similar term the uh, most uh, confusing term with uh, this for this spots is fox for this disease which is apocrine miliaria which will present in pubertal age group of females in the form of extremely itchy skin to hyperpigmented papules present in the axilla or groin or for that matter areas where apocrine glands are present in Uh, higher uh, higher uh, densities why because this condition is due to obstruction of the apocrine duct due to the obstruction of the apocrine duct okay so one question for all of you acne is a disorder of acne is a disorder of please put your answer in the chat section uh, students yes all those who are watching please come on uh, hit that like button if this session was helpful and also answer to my question so that it will be a uh, uh, two way interaction so that uh, i i will not get bored yes my question to all of you is acne is a disorder of yes if you know the answer please please uh, put your answer in the chat section yes all the wonderful friends uh, who are is watching this uh, video so yes acne is a disorder of the pilo sebaceous unit okay if in case uh, you are not aware of this please remember it is a disorder of pilo sebaceous unit pilo sebaceous unit so next uh, we have the pathogenesis of acne vulgar so you can remember there are four grades of acne in which in the grade 1 we have the comedones comedones are present so a few primary lesions uh, you must be aware of so very good uh, dr nikita sharma yes it is pilo sebaceous unit very good you are absolutely right so primary lesions uh, the circumscribed solid raised lesions which you are able to see they are described as papule if the size is less than 1 cm and if the lesion size is more than 1 cm along with the depth component along with the depth component we are going to call it as a nodule we are going to call it as a nodule okay so papule and we are having a plot which is uh, actually basically the papules which are coalescing with each other and the size is more than 1 cm so that is a description which we can use for a plot so uh, in the acne vulgaris we are going to see the comedones in the grade 1 acne and if the patient is having comedones we are going to use the treatment in the form of topical retinoids topical retinoids topical retinoids if there is grade 2 acne what are the lesions which are predominantly seen erythematous papular lesions will be there. erythematous papular lesions will be there in these patients and in the grade 3 we are going to predominantly see the pustular lesions predominantly we are going to see the pustular lesions 
grade 4 nodulocystic lesions will be there so what is the importance of knowing these grades is the treatment will vary from grade 1 to grade 4 so in the grade 1 you can remember topical retinoids are used grade 2 we are going to continue the topical retinoids just we are going to have topical antibiotics grade 3 topical retinoids are again continued oral antibiotics are added oral antibiotics systemic antibiotics are added in the grade 4 the treatment is oral retinoids which is isotretinoin very very important isotretinoin is used in grade 4 acne which is a most severe form of acne vulgaris okay and the indication is of course the nodulocystic acne which is very important and the side effect which you can see is the dry lips dry lips which is chelitis chelitis and uh, monitoring can be uh, should be done with fasting lipid profile and liver function test because there can be derangement of this uh, after the intake of isotretinoin and isotretinoin is a category x drug so whenever we have to prescribe this medication always we must make sure that the patient uh, is not pregnant uh, and also the patient agrees upon that they have to undergo and uh, have urinary pregnancy test and also they should use some kind of contraception okay and you must remember that after the isotretinoin is stopped at least a washout period of one month or 28 days or uh, and three months so uh, any of them okay uh, basically some books say it's one month or some books say it is three months so this is a washout period till when they have to use this contraception they should uh, the female should not get pregnant so coming to the next condition which is hydradenitis suppurativa which is hydradenitis suppurativa so clinically uh, the patients are going to present with nodules abscesses sinuses very uh, bad looking uh, fibrotic scars all this can be seen and basically this is due uh, hydradenitis suppurativa is because of the blockage of the apocrine glands and the hair follicles okay so next we have papillosquamous disorders in which we are going to see psoriasis lichen planus and pitrasis rosa okay but this is the question which was asked related to scaling so this is inacity may 2022 mcq silvery white or mica like scales can be seen in psoriasis yellow greasy scales can be seen in seborrheic dermatitis brani powdery scales can be seen in pitrasis versicola fish like scales can be seen in ichthyosis vulgaris collarate scales seen in pitrasis rosa okay rest of them uh, so this last one mica scales mica like scales can be seen in pitrasis like or not is chronic so these are all the options uh, which uh, can be expected in the future uh, mcqs of the anacity why because our question was already asked so silvery white scale which you are able to see here is classical of psoriasis and yellow greasy scales is classically seen in seborrheic dermatitis yellow greasy scales brani powdery scales can be seen in pitrasis versicolor brani powdery scales collarate scale it is seen in pitrasis rosa so here you are able to see that the scale is attached on the outer surface and it is free on the inner surface fish like scales can be seen in ichthyosis vulgaris fish like scales can be seen in ichthyosis vulgaris leaf like scales uh, in femvigus foliaceus mica like scales in pitrasis lichenoides chronica okay so in the psoriasis uh, what are the important points you must remember it is a t cell mediated uh, inflammatory disorder t cell mediated inflammatory disorder where we are going to see over the skin erythematous plaques with silvery white scaling and not only this uh, psoriasis is a disorder of skin alone even other systems like for example joints that is arthritis can be there and also there is metabolic syndrome the patients can have diabetes the, they can have hypertension and uh, ldl can be elevated so these are all the changes which can be seen and basically the problem is there is associated insulin resistance and one more thing which uh, i wanted to tell from the basics is the stratum basal cell it is going to proliferate and divide and produce the stratum corneum cells stratum corneum cells so in this journey what will be the changes of the keratinocytes is basically 
the cells are going to become more and more flattened and the keratin content is going to increase and nucleus is going to be lost there is going to be dehydration loss of water and the cells are devoid of the nucleus so metabolism is absent why am i telling you this is because in the case of normal skin the epidermal transit time which is basically the time period taken by the stratum basal cell to reach the surface of the skin and to ultimately get shed off into the environment this is called as epidermal transit time skin doubling time or turnover time skin turnover time so this is on an average in the range of 42 to 75 days so this is a range which you can remember but in the case of this psoriasis in the case of psoriasis what will happen this epidermal transit time it is going to reduce by one tenth it is going to reduce by one tenth so it will become four to seven days it will become four to seven days and this is the reason why we are going to see the scales visible over the patient's body and the sites where the lesions classically are seen are extensors in psoriasis so psoriasis you can remember it is also called as chronic block psoriasis or psoriasis vulgaris chronic block psoriasis or psoriasis vulgaris so psoriasis can also affect the scalp but there will not be any hair loss no hair loss will be seen no hair loss will be there coming to some negative point psoriasis never involves the central nervous system and it will never affect the mucosa there will not be any itching and there will not be any hair loss alopecia will not be there so related to the nails in the psoriasis please remember we are going to see the nail pits so how can you remember this uh, okay uh, not remember but we can say a simple analogy by what kalam ji told so small aim is a crime always have a great aim so if you try to aim for the stars at least you can reach the moon so likewise uh, try to be the inscit Uh, try to complete the syllabus of the INSCT. Okay, so if you target like this, uh, you are going to do great. You are going to have satisfaction in the examination hall, and also it is going to help in your neat preparation as well. Okay, so coming to the psoriasis topic again, nail psoriasis. We are going to see pits, and these pits as a uh, nail pits, as I have already told you, they can be described as. deep irregular coarse pits deep irregular and coarse pits are seen and uh, apart from this the most important the most pathognomonic feature of the nail psoriasis is oil drop sign it is oil drop sign okay and we can also see the deposition of the material uh, below the nail plate which is called as subungual hyperkeratosis which is called as sub angul hyperkeratosis so we can also see separation of the nail plate from the underlying nail bed it is called as onycholysis it is called as onycholysis okay so coming to the histopath changes which we can see in psoriasis so in the stratum corneum we are going to see retention of the nuclei which is called as parakeratosis parakeratosis we are also going to see micro abscesses which are called as monorose microabscess which are collection of the neutrophils in the stratum corneum in the stratum granulosum the uh, layer stratum granulosum is going to be very thin or absent in the psoriasis patients in the stratum spinosum what we are going to see is uh, there will be thickening of the stratum spinosum which is called as acanthosis which is called as acanthosis whereas in the case of the papilla in the papilla you can remember there is going to be dilated tortuous blood vessels which are running inside the dermal papilla dermal papilla okay and the retinal edges are elongated regularly so elongation of the retinal edges can also be seen and in the stratum spinosum just remember one more uh, micro abscess which are called as spongiform pustules of kogoj kogoj uh microabscess can also be seen in the stratum spinosum in the psoriasis so coming to the uh, variations of the psoriasis depending upon the regions so in the 
inverse psoriasis there will be involvement of the flexures because normally it is extensors so if it is inverted in uh, uh, nature that is uh, the sites which are affected are opposite to that of extensor so that is flexure so it is called as inverse psoriasis or flexural psoriasis and what is important here in these patients no scaling can be seen there will not be any scaling so the sites can be any flexure as you can see inframammary area can be affected uh, gluteal cleft anti-cubital fossa all these sites uh, are the ones which are affected in inverse psoriasis so systemic therapy usually remember the treatment is going to be with methotrexate or acetrate but in the case of a pregnant woman who is having this psoriasis steroids cannot be used so in pregnancy we are not left with any other option except for steroids okay otherwise there are other medications like methotrexate and we can also use acetrate second drug of choice in the pregnant woman who is having uh, this psoriasis is cyclosporin okay cyclosporin and you must remember one more point the examiner might mention that a pregnant woman who is having uh, uncontrolled diabetes mellitus is also having psoriasis uh, then what is also having pustular psoriasis what is important for you to remember pustular or erythrodermic psoriasis okay so if these are present in a pregnant woman along with diabetes mellitus then in such case steroids cannot be used so instead of steroid steroids we are having the second line of medication which is a calcineurin inhibitor which is cyclosporin cyclosporin and uh, the pustular psoriasis of pregnancy it is called as impetigo herpetiformis pustular psoriasis of pregnancy is called as impetigo herpetiformis and there are some uh, adverse effects associated with the treatment you treatment modality used in psoriasis so pua therapy which is soralin and uva it is ha associated with increased risk of squamous cell carcinoma cyclosporin it is associated with nephrotoxicity nephrotoxicity methotrexate can cause it, uh, it is a abortive patient used uh, routinely in gynec department acetratin is associated with mucositis and also it is uh, uh, having teratogenic properties so this is a pustular psoriasis where we are going to see sheets or lakes of pus and in the erythrodermic psoriasis we are going to see a red skin almost involving the entire body associated with scaling associated with scaling so we have gutted psoriasis this is a special variety of psoriasis where the lesions will be present in a raindrop fashion raindrop fashion the lesions can be seen in this patients raindrop fashion you can remember this is a, so, a type of psoriasis where group a beta hemolytic streptococcus can trigger the gutted psoriasis so the treatment can be with antibiotics treatment can be with antibiotics so some signs related to the psoriasis auspitz and kobner's phenomenon and we have voronoff's ring so auspitz sign and kobner's phenomenon are very important so in auspitz and we are going to take a glass slide and we are going to scrape the scales so if we are scraping what will happen there will be ultimately pinpoint bleeding spots which can be seen and this is referred to as auspitz sign this is referred to as auspitz sign this is referred to as auspitz sign positivity and what is kobner's phenomenon the, the appearance of the morphologically similar lesions along the lines of the trauma is called as kobner's phenomenon or kibner's phenomenon or isomorphic response uh, isomorphic response okay and pseudo kobner's phenomenon please remember it is seen in the case of yes can anyone tell me what is the answer for the question pseudo kobner's phenomenon can be seen in the patients who are having yes anyone who is uh, who knows the answer for this question please uh, put your answer in the chat section pseudo kobner's phenomenon can be seen in viral infection due to auto inoculation can you give me the 
names of those uh, viral infections in which we can see pseudococtus phenomena so they are viral warts and molluscum contagious molluscum contagious okay viral warts and molluscum contagious so the lichen planus just remember five piece pruritic purple plain topped papules and plaques will be seen so as you are able to see here over the wrist area and in the lichen planus we can also see this term called as wickham stray which is nothing but the reticulate lacy pattern which can be seen over the skin reticulate lacy pattern of the network which you are able to see over the skin yes uh, very good uh, uh nathu shibu it is molluscum very good so i am getting a little bit of lag from the actual answer uh, till the point which i am able to see the uh, comment okay very good you have answered it right so in the nail involvement just remember the most characteristic finding of the lichen planus is pterygium pterygium okay so this is the pterygium which you are able to see which is characteristic of the lichen planus and coming to the changes on histopathology in lichen planus in lichen planus please remember we can see hyperkeratosis we can see hypergranulosis and there is going to be thickening of stratum spinosum which is called as acanthosis and in the retar ridges we can see saw tooth retar ridges saw toothing of the retar ridges can be seen and uh, here you are able to see this is the wedge shaped hypergranulosis hyper granulosis and you are able to see band like lymphocytic infiltrate band like lymphocytic infiltrate lymphocytic infiltrate can be seen in the dermis or precisely dermo epidermal junction dermo epidermal junction and you are able to see this is a saw tooth retar ridges this is a saw tooth retar ridges which you are able to see and we can also see civet bodies cytoid bodies or colloid bodies which are nothing but apatotic bodies uh, which are the nothing but the keratinocytes due to the damage caused by the lymphocytes which are caused by the lymphocytes okay so this is uh, just for your reference purpose which i am putting you can uh, easily uh, summarize you can uh, summarize and uh, try to memorize whatever are the differences between lichen planus and psoriasis okay coming to pityriasis rosacea pityriasis wherever it is there you must remember it is scaling and rosacea is red red color and a pityriasis rosacea is basically papillosquamous disorder which is triggered by human herpes virus 7 human herpes virus 7 and it is a self limiting condition so initially there is going to be a herald patch there will be a herald patch which is nothing but a annular lesion which is annular lesion having collaret scale having a collaret scale okay we have already seen this and you can just remember the features of pitras rosacea with the help of this beautiful image where you are able to see the legends ms dhoni and virat kohli wearing the jersey names of their mothers on the occasion of the mothers day on the occasion of the mothers day okay and uh, yes you are able to see one more thing here the dhoni is wearing the jersey number which is 7 so with the help of that you can remember that the human herpes virus 7 is associated with pityriasis rosacea pityriasis rosacea that is the thing which you, uh, you can remember from this image and also you can remember that mother patch mother patch mother patch is associated with pityriasis rosacea pityriasis rosacea and also not only that they are going to celebrate the christmas so christmas tree pattern so they have won the game and they are going to celebrate the christmas gra very grandly uh, in a grand fashion okay so christmas tree pattern can also be remember and not only that they are having this t-shirts which are having collar 
so collared scale also can be remembered from this okay just remember this one image of uh, dhoni and kohli uh, wearing the jersey names of their mothers with the help of that you can remember the entire uh, petrus's rosha so we can't call a person as a failure if he or she never gives up uh, their efforts so remember this very important uh, uh, think uh, associated uh, with the many students nowadays because they are unable to do the studies thinking that they are already failure so you are not a failure till you leave uh, your preparation okay always carry on with your preparation despite how much uh, depressed you might feel or anxiety if you are having more problem <coughs> you can reach out to us for help so this is the lesion <coughs> these are the lesion which you are able to see which are having this christmas tree pattern which is have which are having this christmas tree pattern so come into the fungal infections petrus is versicolor petrus is scaling versicolor is variety of uh, colors uh, are there in this so the causative agent uh, you can remember it is malassezia globosa malassezia furfur patient presents with asymptomatic peri follicular scaly macules which uh, the scaling is defined as fine brani or purpureous scale and the lesions can have hypopigmentation or hyperpigmentation hypo or hyperpigmentation so these are the lesions which you are able to see multiple hypopigmented macules which are coalescing to form larger patches larger patches so this is not only hyperpigmented but it can also be hyperpigmented also so if you perform a 10% potassium hydroxide mound you can see the presence of the hyphae and the spores and the description given for this is spaghetti and meatball appearance spaghetti is described uh, uh as a hyphae whereas the uh, meat balls are nothing but the spores so this is a comparison okay this is a comparison use and uh, on wood slamp examination we are going to see in petrus versicolor a uh, yellow fluorescence okay this color is also very important yellow fluorescence can be seen and in petrus versicolor remember recurrences are very common even after completion of the treatment and the treatment is going to be with azoles the treatment is going to be with azoles which are antifungal medications and not only azole remember one more uh, term one more uh, uh, drug or we can say topical preparation which is selenium sulfide which is not having azole in it but it is used in the petrus versicolor okay so coming to tinea capitis in the non inflammatory and inflammatory these are the two types of tinea capitis please remember in the inflammatory tinea capitis the we are going to have a hair loss which is permanent that is scarring alopecia will be there and the examples of the inflammatory tinea capitis are kirion and fevers extremely extremely important for your exams whereas in the non inflammatory variety of tinea capitis we have black dot and gray patch variety of tinea capitis black dot and gray patch so first one is black dot type so you can see the fungus grows into the hair and this is endothrix variety this is example of endothrix variety and the causative agent is trichophyton trichophyton and the reason why it is called black dot is because of this endothrix nature the hairs are going to be damaged and they are going to cut uh, over the surface of the scalp giving rise to this swollen hair follicles which are looking like black dots okay next one is non inflammatory type tinea capitis next gray patch variety so in the gray patch variety you can remember it is ectothrix so there will be scaling present surrounding the hair follicle so the appearance of the color that is a color which we can see through the naked eyes green color so it is called as gray patch type of tinea capitis and the causative agent is microsporum canis the causative agent is microsporum canis next in fevers you can remember two important points the causative agent is trichophyton shonlini and we are going to see scutula in this patient we are going to see scutula which is nothing but the crust nothing but the cup shaped crust 
and the key reason how the examiner will give you the uh, question is that a child is coming with the complaints of hair loss and there is also boggy swelling this is very important descriptive term boggy indurated swelling and also there will be easily plucable hair this is one more clue which can be given easily plucable hairs if you perform a kvh mod you can identify the fungal elements fungal elements and this is the boggy swelling which you are able to see over the scalp with complete hair loss and the causative agents are trichophyton mentagrophytes and trichophyton verrucosum trichophyton ver uh, verrucosum and mentagrophytes and the next uh, variety of tinea are tinea corporis sacrurus and here you are able to see annular block with central clearing with central clearing and scaling will be present at the margins scaling will be present at the margin there are various types of annular lesions you can remember in lupus vulgaris which is a type of cretan tuberculosis there is going to be central scarring central scarring will be there. tinea corporis there is going to be central clearing in leash manases there is going to be central crusting there is going to be a central crusting in the case of uh, leash manases okay now coming to sporotrichosis sporotrichosis okay one second yeah sporotrichosis chromoblastomycosis and mycetoma these are very important subcutaneous mycosis so in sporotrichosis which is also called as rose gardener's disease the, the history will be given like farmer coming with the complaints of the nodular lesions along the lymphatics or the examiner also can mention linear nodules or papillary nodules are present over the body or they can mention it has sporot required pattern so all these are one and the same and when you are able to see this kind of uh, a description even always you should think about the sporotrichosis which is produced by sporotrich shinki sporotrich shinki and on histopathology you can see asteroid bodies asteroid bodies uh, can be seen in the patients of sporotrichosis uh, can anyone tell me in, uh, which other condition can we see this asteroid bodies apart from the sporotrichosis uh, though the asteroid bodies can be seen uh, those other conditions so uh, please put your answer in the chat section but uh, the better answer the better uh, association with asteroid bodies is seen in the patients of sporotrichosis okay okay uh, so, so it is sarcoidosis okay i hope you might be knowing this in sarcoidosis also we can see asteroid bodies okay so next we have uh, verrucous dermatitis which is also called as chromoblastomycosis so in this we are going to see de pigmented dermatitis fungi as a causative organisms and the clinical lesion is going to be a single large verrucous block a single large verrucous block will be there and the history can be the same here also after the inoculation uh, of this uh, uh, pigmented fungi through the prick here also the thorn prick can be mentioned in the exam uh, examination question but what is important is the finding which we are able to see after the thorn trick that is what is important if it is verrucous lesion think about chromoblastomycosis in this you might have uh, heard uh, and read in your uh, histopath already copper penny bodies medullar bodies sclerotic bodies muriform bodies are seen in chromoblastomycosis histopathology so next is madura foot mycetoma mycetoma just remember the examiner uh, is going to give you a case scenario where uh, adult male coming with the complaints of swelling of the lower extremities and there may be history of some kind of a prick some kind of a prick can be given so along with this clues if you are able to see this triad of gst which is grains sinuses and tumefaction tumefaction is nothing but swelling so if all these features are present then you should always think about mycetoma mycetoma and basically these granules are nothing but the colonies of the microorganisms which you can see so they are the granules are colonies of the microorganisms which you can see 
and there can also be sinus tracts which will discharge or uh, these granules okay these granules will be discharged so next we are going to quickly see the mycobacterial infections so tuberculosis verrucosa cutis which is uh, tbvc can present as verrucous plaques over the body verrucous plaques over the body next we have lupus vulgaris in which we are going to see one margin is going to extend and the another margin is going to scar so annular lesion which is having a central scarring this is a classical description for lupus vulgaris okay and in fact lupus vulgaris is the most common form of cutaneous tuberculosis which we can see in adults which we can see in adults and there is one test which you must remember related to lupus vulgaris which is called as dioscopy which is called as dioscopy which is called as dioscopy and in this you are going to take a glass slide and press the lesion of the lupus vulgaris then we are going to see what is called as yes what do we see in lupus vulgaris can anyone put in the ch chart section if you know the answer please put it in the chart section we are going to see apple jelly nodules we are going to see apple jelly nodules uh, on dioscopy now coming to scrofuloderma it is also called as tubercular lymphadenitis and in this there is going to be a focus of the tuberculous bacilli in the form uh, in uh, in the lymph nodes or in the bones or in the joints there is tuberculous bacilli which is proliferating and it will proliferate so much that it will rupture uh, the damage that structure and it will reach the skin surface where it will manifest initially in the form of these uh, nodules and ultimately they are going to break open and they are going to form sinuses ulcers ulcers and sinuses so this is called as scrofuloderma next we have tuberculid which are hypersensitivity reaction to the mycobacterium tuberculosis bacilli it is type for hypersensitivity reaction the patients are going to have a very very good immunity the ba basic problem here is that the skin is not the site where the tb bacilli are uh, proliferating but elsewhere in the body it can be in the pulmonary uh, lungs pulmonary tuberculosis gi system cns anywhere the tb bacilli are there they are proliferating and they are mounting hypersensitivity reaction which is type 4 hypersensitivity reaction because of which there are lesions which which are seen and remember these patients have a very good immunity cell mediated immunity so man 2 test will be positive man 2 test will be positive and if you do a histopathology there is going to be a beautiful tuberculoid uh, granuloma formation and there are no microorganism seen in the biopsy in this patients in the skin so culture is going to be always negative and the patients are going to respond to the anti tubercular therapy so att stands for anti tubercular therapy so papillonecrotic tuberculid papillonecrotic tuberculid it is seen in young adults and lesions are uh, just remember the papules will be there which have a necrotic surface which have a necrotic surface so papillonecrotic tuberculids and mainly they are present over the extensor of the extremities extensor of the extremities so next we have lichen scrofulosorum so this is a type of tuberculid where we are going to see in a child usually there will be presence of multiple lichenoid grouped papules can be seen over the body okay this is how the disc, uh, uh, the lichen scrofulosorum manifest mainly lesions will be present over the tongue next we have erythem enduratum of buzzin erythem enduratum of buzzin so basically this is a paniculitis lobular paniculitis where we are going to see red tender nodules over the posterior aspect that is calf portion of the leg calf portion of the leg and the lesions are going to ultimately rupture and they are going to form scarring and also ulceration initially okay uh, ultimately healing with scar next you have erythema nodosum which is an example of septal paniculitis so uh, we have seen buzzin's disease erythema enduratum of buzzin which was a lobular paniculitis and erythema nodosum this is a example of septal paniculitis septal paniculitis and here we can see red tender nodules over the anterior aspect of the leg and the patients are not going to have any in uh, uh, what we can say scarring or ulceration in the patients of 
ఎరిదమ నోడోజం ఓకే వెన్ ఇన్ కాంట్రాస్ట్ ఎరిదమ ఎండిరేటమ్ ఆఫ్ బజన్ ఇట్ ఈస్ అసోసియేట్ రిలేషన్స్ ఓవర్ ది బ్యాక్ ఓ ద పోస్టీరియర్ ఆస్పెక్ట్ అండ్ యూఆర్ ఏబుల్ టు సీ వెరీ వెరీ బ్యాడ్ అల్సర్స్ విచ్ హీల్ విత్ స్కారింగ్ ఇన్ ద పేషెంట్స్ ఆఫ్ ఎరిదమ ఎండిరేటమ్ ఆఫ్ బజన్ సో ఫ్యూ పాయింట్స్ అబౌట్ హ్యాండ్స్ అండ్ డిసీజ్ కాజిటివ్ ఏజెంట్ ఇస్ మైకోబ్యాక్టర్ లెప్రే పాజిటివ్ ఏజెంట్ ఇస్ మైకోబ్యాక్టర్ లెప్రే and just remember this is a infectious condition in which we are going to take into account the host cell mated immunity to say what will be the prognosis of the patients okay this is something interesting and the classification which are following is uh, ridley joplin classification ridley joplin classification and uh, we have two poles it is a spectral condition on one pole we have tuberculoid and other pole we have lepromatous leprosy so just remember that as we move from left to right that is tuberculoid to the lepromatous and the immunity is going to reduce tremendously the uh, immunity is going to be very very poor on the lepromatous side and the disease is very very disseminated in the lepromatous leprosy side whereas in the tuberculoid pole the immunity is very very good so cell mated immunity is very good and there is a limited disease there is a limited disease uh, in this so this thing okay next so in the uh, the few points related to each of this uh, 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 types of uh, hands and disease so tt leprosy remember we are going to have a annular block with central clearing central clearing will be there. and uh, periphery well defined raised margins will be there. well defined raised margins will be there at the periphery well defined uh, uh, raised margins will be there so just like uh, tinea this lesion is appearing but the difference is that uh, in hands and disease there will not be any itching next we have the bt variety of hands and disease which is borderline tuberculoid variety in which we can see satellite lesions we can see satellite lesions satellite lesions are nothing but the m lepre is trying to free itself from this lesion and it is trying to jump on to the adjacent normal looking skin because of which there will be smaller lesions which are given this descriptive term called as satellite lesion satellite lesions and in the mid borderline leprosy which is also called as bb leprosy we can see geographic or map like skin lesions geographic or map like skin lesions and the buzzwords which are associated with the lesions are inverted saucer shaped lesions and we are also going to see punched out punched out inner border punched out inner border and this punched out inner border is giving rise to this appearance called as swiss cheese appearance it is giving rise to swiss cheese appearance swiss cheese appearance okay lepromatous leprosy remember there is going to be infiltration of the skin uh, over the face you are able to see ear is also infiltrated this is giving rise to one important face uh, can anyone tell me in the chat section what is this uh, face uh, described as yes uh, and uh, for all the students if you are uh, having uh, some kind of knowledge gained through this session please do hit that like button and also do subscribe and also share this to your friends and yes as i have already asked please in the chat section write down what is this uh, face described as in the case of lepromatous leprosy so what is this facies i hope uh, uh, there is some lag maybe that is the reason why you are unable to uh, connect so it is called as leo 9 facies it is called as leo there is uh, some gap or a uh, lag so sorry for that so you get what you focus on so focus on what you want focus on what you want you are going to ultimately get it okay so the next uh, 
variety of the leprosy is indeterminate uh, variety of leprosy remember ridley choplin classification does not include this indeterminate leprosy and also pure neuritic variety of leprosy okay so in the, this what how can you differentiate both these conditions is in indeterminate leprosy the lesion uh, the, in both of them basically child is going to present with hypopigmented lesions over the face so these uh, this is the common thing uh, associated with uh, these two and what is the differences please remember in pityriasis alba there is going to be scaling there is going to be scaling pityriasis means scaling alba means white color okay so pityriasis alba scaling will be there whereas in indeterminate leprosy please remember there is going to be atrophy of the skin there is going to be atrophy of the skin okay so this is how you can differentiate and also in pityriasis alba if you observe there will be multiple lesions present over the face whereas in indeterminate leprosy there is going to be a single lesion which can be seen over the face so now coming to the reactions uh, remember type 1 reaction type 2 reaction these are the two reactions uh, type 2 reaction is also called as erythema nodosum leprosum and you, you, i hope you all know this rule of 5 rule of 5 says that type 1 reaction is type 4 hypersensitivity reaction type 4 hypersensitivity reaction why because type 1 reaction plus 4 will give 5 so type 2 lepra reaction is a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction so 1 plus 4 will give you 5 and 3 plus 2 will give you a 5 i hope this is helpful please uh, uh, do uh, confirm in the chat section just like this video if it was helpful and in the spectrum you can remember that uh, type 1 reaction is associated it is seen in the borderline category whereas the type 2 reaction it is seen in it is seen in the basically lepromatous uh, end so basically you can remember on the lepromatous uh, end we have mo mainly type 2 lepra reaction and uh, on the borderline we are having type 1 lepra reaction so because type 2 lepra reaction is a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction so there will be this immune complexes deposited everywhere in the body so there is a possibility of the new lesions new lesions in type 2 lepra reaction giving rise to erythema nodosum leprosum whereas type 1 reaction type 1 lepra reaction is a cell mediated immunity so there is going to be pre-existing skin lesions which will be inflamed and even the nerves can also show this uh, hypersensitivity reaction giving rise to this neuritis giving rise to this neuritis and remember the treatment of choice for both these uh, types of reactions is steroids in both of the, uh, these conditions the uh, treatment of choice is steroids drug of choice is steroids so this is the type 1 lepra reaction where you are able to see that the lesion the, the Hansen's lesion which was present which is pre-existing is becoming inflamed it is becoming inflamed okay here also you are able to see this is a patient having inflammation so now coming to type 2 lepra reaction type 2 lepra reaction there will be multiple nodular lesions which will be present over the body so this is also called as erythema nodosum leprosum that is the reason why it is also called as erythema nodosum leprosum so now coming to this world health organization which has created so much of uh, uh, you know a nonsense for these students world health organization says one thing nlep says one thing <sighs> finally okay so remember world health organization what it says is it has made some changes recently for leprosy so if a patient is having more than or equal to six lesions over the body what are those lesions hypoaesthetic hypopigmented or erythematous lesions along with even one nerve if it is thicken then we are going to consider it as a multi bacillary and if you perform a biopsy or a slit skin smear the afb is going to show you the bacilli so if any one of this is present in the patient then we are going to call it call the patient as multi bacillary patient <clears throat> if the sss is positive or if there is one or more now and if you are able to see more than or equal to six 
uh, number of the patches then we are going to call it as a multi bacillary leprosy multi bacillary leprosy <clears throat> and in the according to world health organization the treatment is going to be in the posse bacillary in posse bacillary as well as in the multi bacillary the number of the drugs which are going to use is 3 3 drugs will be used in both of them the only difference is going to be of the duration the duration in pb leprosy is going to be for 6 months whereas in multi bacillary it is going to be for a period of 12 months so this is the difference which you are going to see in pb leprosy and multi bacillary leprosy so we are actually following the national uh, leprosy eradication program nlep which says that see if a patient is having no or one nerve which is involved we are going to call it as a posse bacillary leprosy according to the national leprosy eradication program but according to world health organization it says if even one nerve is thickened we have to categorize it under multi bacillary leprosy okay so what are the medications which you are going to use basically dapsone rifampicin and clofazamine you can very easily remember the dosages so just follow uh, uh, what i am saying so in pb and mb the medications are and the dosages are going to be the same the only difference is going to be the duration the duration will be six months in the case of uh, pb leprosy and it is 12 months in multi bacillary leprosy and what are the drugs dapsone is used Dapsone is used 100 milligrams daily 100 milligrams daily dosage is used and rifampicin is used 600 milligrams once a month under supervision so once in a month dose is always supervised this is what you must remember so this is supervised so 600 mg dapsone supervised once a month sorry the rifampicin and dapsone is 100 mg daily without any supervision no supervision is needed whereas clofazamine it is very very characteristic if you can remember dapsone and rifampicin doses it is very easy for clofazamine so half of the rifampicin dose which is 300 milligrams is going to be once a month medication used under supervision which is clofazamine okay so 600 mg half is 300 mg once a month under supervision clopazamine is the medication whereas 100 mg daily without any supervision is the dose of dapsone so just half it it will be 50 mg 50 mg daily dose is the non-supervised medication clopazamine which is used okay so this is how you can remember the medications for leprosy possible as well as multi bacillary so dapsone rifampicin and clopazamine and 100 mg 600 mg 300 mg and 50 mg i hope this is very simple for you to remember and very clear so this these are the blister packs which you can re, uh, remember so this is according to the nlep regimen the blister packs are used so we are not going to go into the details yeah type 1 lepra reaction uh, the treatment of choice the drug of choice is steroids type 2 lepra reaction also the drug of choice is steroids again but if the patient is not responding to the steroids or okay if the patient is having diabetes or any kind of metabolic syndrome then we are we should not use steroids so in such case we are going to use a gold standard medication which is thalidomide which is thalidomide thalidomide has no role whatsoever in type 1 lepra reaction it is used in type 2 lepra reaction okay so next we are having this uh, allergic contact dermatitis so here you are able to see a patient is having contact dermatitis to hair dye and the medic medic the chemical which you must remember is paraphenylene diamine which is ppd ppd in the hair dye can produce allergic contact dermatitis allergic contact dermatitis and in the metals nickel is going to produce this allergic contact dermatitis 
whereas in the topical antibiotic remember and neomycin can cause allergy contact dermatitis in the cement we have potassium dichromate which can produce this allergy contact dermatitis and in the bindi the adhesive which consists of ptbp paratexyl butyl phenol can causes acd okay so coming to patch test so patch test works on the principle of identifying the type 4 hypersensitivity reaction and it is used in the diagnosis of allergic contact dermatitis it is very very important it is the investigation of choice and you can uh, remember that patches will be applied over the back and the readings are going to be taken at The first reading is at 48 hours and the second reading is going to be taken at 96 hours. So when the first reading is taken, the, the patch is removed. The patch is removed and we are going to take the first reading. But please remember the second reading is the best reading because we can identify some, we can identify any late re, uh, uh, reactions in the patients. So that is why it is the best reading at 96 hours. Atopic dermatitis, it is uh, endogenous eczema, you can remember, due to the exogenous factors which are triggering. So the patients are going to have a atopic triad of, uh, of course, eczema, which is a skin changes, along with that allergic rhinitis, upper respiratory involvement, and bronchial asthma, lower respiratory involvement. And you can see the classical uh, uh, finding will be the erythematous cheeks can be seen erythematous uh, cheeks can be seen in the infantile phase and of course uh, atopic dermatitis investigation of choices clinical examination very important for you to remember clinical examination and pruritus is going to be present and typical morphology chronically relapsing dermatitis personal family history so these are all the key diagnostic criteria according to Hanifin and Rajka very very important uh, name Hanifin Rajka and you are able to see these uh, infra orbital fold which is called as Denny Morgan fold can be seen in atopic dermatitis now coming to the urtic area so in the urtic area remember it is IgE mediated type 1 hypersensitivity reaction due to the triggering of the mast cells which will release a histamine which will release a histamine and we are going to see the lesions which are referred to as primary lesions wheels and we can also see characteristic dermographism which is nothing but graphism is ability to write dermo is skin so over the skin we can write so this is called as dermographism and the next condition is cutaneous mastocytosis remember it is also called as urticaria pigmentosa urticaria pigmentosa and basically underneath these hyperpigmented lesions there is a proliferation of the mast cells so if you trigger if you traumatize these lesions what will happen there will be release of histamine so then there is going to be formation of this wheel transient wheel this is called as derrier sign very important derrier sign is not seen in derrier this is derrier sign is seen in the urticaria pigmentos okay now viral infection veruca vulgaris so they are the asymptomatic papules and blocks which we can see and rough surface will be present so there can be auto inoculation uh, and spread to the new sites which we call it as pseudo cobner's phenomenon if you remember and there are various uh, uh, you know uh, types of <laughs> human papillom virus you can remember uh, them simply with the help of this uh, trick dsp123 so i hope you might have heard this song uh, okay that is from this movie pushpa so the music director was DSP. So you can remember DSP 1, 2, 3. Devi Shri Prasad. So D stands for D plantar warts. S stands for superficial plantar warts. And P stands for plain warts. Which is also called as Veruca plana. And uh, the next, the other varieties of the uh, Veruca are common wart. Which is also called as Veruca vulgaris. Which is associated with HPV 4. The rest of the others you can easily remember see larynx has how many letters in it six so laryngeal papillomatosis is associated with hpv six butcher has how many letters in it b u t c h e r 
butcher has seven letters b u t c h e r seven alphabet so hpv seven is associated with butcher and epidermal dysplasia verruca formis is associated with hp5 and in the treatment you can remember salicylic acid cautery radio frequency cautery or cryotherapy these can be used in the treatment so next we have plain warts plain warts and plain warts are the also called as verruca plana so warts which have flat surface they are called as plain warts and as i have already told you hpv3 dsp so hpv3 and apart from that even hpv10 is also associated with verruca plana so in the hpv infections uh, you can remember the filiform warts will have finger like projections will have finger like projections finger like projections and you can uh, see these are present surrounding the nails so they are called as sub ungual warts they are called as sub ungual warts they are called as sub ungual warts so this we have already seen and molluscum contagiosum this is the next viral infection where we are going to see pearly white dome shaped umbilicated papules pearly white dome shaped umbilicated papules and here you are able to see they are present in a single line because of the auto inoculation there is development of new lesions so this is an example of pseudo cobner's phenomenon coming to varicella which is also called as chicken pox it is produced by varicella zoster virus varicella zoster virus and you can see dew drop on rose petal appearance dew drop on rose petal appearance herpes zoster it is a reactivation of the vzb virus it is also called as shingles very important condition where there is going to be unilateral arrangement of the grouped vesicles over erythematous base in a dermatomal fashion so if you are able to see this is a dermatome which is having this erythematous base on the top of which there are vesicles there are vesicles present and this condition is extremely painful for the patients remember this point so these points you might have read this is okay so oral hairy leukoplakia oral hairy leukoplakia it is seen associated with in hiv patients and uh, it is associated with epstein barr virus where the patients are going to have white corrugated ridge like border over the lateral aspect of the tongue lateral aspect of the tongue lateral aspect of the tongue and this cannot be easily rubbed off and the treatment is going to be with H A A R T antiretroviral therapy. If it is given, then there is going to be improvement in the lesions. So next we have Kaposi sarcoma. Kaposi sarcoma. Just remember that it is seen in individuals who are immunocompromised. It can be due to HIV or chemotherapy. So it is basically a multifocal vascular tumor. Multifocal vascular tumor, which is manifesting over the skin and mucosa. In the skin, purplish nodules and plaques will be there, and mucosa also similar lesions will be there. and it is associated with h h v 8 associated with h h v 8 okay so this is the question which was asked uh, in one of the previous year questions hiv patient with these lesions what is your diagnosis so if you are able to see o oh, uh, over the uh, m- uh, mucosa or the palate you are able to see that there are purplish colored plaques and nodules so this is also characteristic lesion mucosal lesion precisely of kaposi sarcoma which is due to human herpes virus 8 next we have enteroviral infections uh, which is going to produce a condition called as hand foot mouth disease and the causative agents are coxaki ea6 and enterovirus 71 where we are going to see the manifest in, in the form of papillovesicular lesions so here you are able to see papillovesicular lesions present over the hand foot also will have some uh, similar lesions and also in the mouth Uh, the the erosions can be seen so this is called as hand foot mouth disease next we have melasma melasma just uh, remember that it is going to present bilaterally symmetrically hyperpigmented lesions over the cheeks and the nose and the important differential which you must remember is chikungunya fever producing uh, melasma like hyperpigmentation over the nose which is called as chikungunya which is called as chikungunya so this is a chikungunya which you are able to see in chikungunya fever and next we have mongolian spot uh, nevus of eto nevus of pota 
so these are the three conditions in which we are going to see melanocytes in the dermis dermal melanocytosis can be seen in these conditions and infants are the ones who are going to have this blue colored lesion or the lumbosacral area lumbosacral area and these lesions are going to resolve spontaneously there is going to be spontaneous resolution so nevus of ota the, there is a going to be so similar bluish discoloration will be seen but in unilateral uh, area affecting mainly the skin over the face that is the most important thing the area which is supplied by the trigeminal nerve that is that is the most important okay and you can remember o for o and o for ophthalmology so wherever there is eye involvement with bluish pigmentation remember it is nevus of ota nevus of ota you are able to see sclera is also blue in color here so next is nevus of ito so where the lesion the bluish discoloration will be seen over the scalp area sorry over the scapular area what i want to see and this is becker's nevus this is becker's nevus where you can see hyperpigmentation hyperpigmentation brown hyperpigmentation of the skin along with hypertrichosis increased hair growth increased pigmentation will be seen and it is going to manifest during puberty in the puberty we are going to see these changes in a male unilaterally this is called as becker's nevus this is called as a becker's nevus coming to the vitiligo vulgaris this is a most common type of vitiligo vulgaris wherever it is a most common type i hope you all know this so symmetrically distributed deep pigmented chalky white macular lesions can be seen over the body so there is one entity called as segmental vitiligo segmental vitiligo where we are going to see uh, over one segment there is going to be deep pigmentation of the skin following a dermatome following a dermatome so there will not be any crossing over from the left to right or left right to left so midline demarcation will be there the lesion does not cross the midline okay so these patients are going to have poor prognosis the medical treatments will not be helpful surgical treatment is the one which is preferred so acrofacial vitiligo acra extremities and face will have the vitiligo lesions so here you are able to see the patient uh, is having scobner's phenomenon positivity and leukotrichia is positive leukotrichia co positive and scobner's phenomenon positive here you are able to see similar vitiligo uh, isomorphic lesions are produced along the lines of the trauma chemical leukoderma remember bindi leukoderma is due to para tertiary butyl phenol ptbp chemical leukoderma of the legs at the areas where the slippers are going to touch the skin that is due to the rubber having monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone so this is a rubber footwear having mbeh monobenzyl ether of hydroquinone so nutritional dermatology this is phrenoderma which is going to manifest as follicular hyperkeratosis follicular hyperkeratosis over the elbow area and also over the knees due to the vitamin a deficiency vitamin c deficiency vitamin e deficiency and also there can be deficiency of essential fatty acids so vitamin a c e and essential fatty acid deficiency okay so next we have this riboflavin or vitamin b2 deficiency which will manifest as angular stomatitis angular stomatitis and this is pellagra which is due to vitamin b3 deficiency which is also called as niacin and this is classically called as castles necklace this is called as castles necklace and this is due to the zinc deficiency zinc deficiency which is seen in children this is called as acrodermatitis enteropathica where we can see dermatitic changes uh, in the peri orifacial skin perineum peri oral peri all the orifices around the uh, the orifices you can see the dermatitis changes so this is 
very classical for acrodermatitis enteropathica due to the defect in the zinc absorption so in this the the features which we can see in the pellagra and ade are almost same with one difference okay in pellagra we can see 3d's dermatitis dementia and diarrhea okay so dermatitis diarrhea and dementia so in the acrodermatitis enteropathica we are not going to see dementia but we are going to see in that place alopecia that is loss of hair will be there but otherwise rest of the others diarrhea and dermatitis will be the same so here also we can see dermatitis and diarrhea so lifelong zinc supplementation is going to help in this patients few points related to malignancy so a b c d e a b c d asymmetry border irregularities color irregularities diameter more than 0.6 mm and evolution of the lesions or uh, pigmented lesion can be seen in malignant melanoma malignant melanoma the most common variety is superficial spreading type and you can see that the pre existing mole or nevus can give rise to malignant melanoma and the most important thing which you must remember is congenital melanocytic nevus the congenital melanocytic nevus can uh, give rise to can it can turn out to be a malignant melanoma just we should monitor these patients very very carefully and congenital melanocytic nevus is going to present at birth in the form of hyperpigmented lesions along with hypertrichosis so this is the manifestation of the congenital melanocytic nevus so these are all the images so coming to basal cell carcinoma just uh, remember that this is the most common primary malignancy of the skin that is important point and apart from that you can see that there will be a pearly white nodule can be there and there can be a rim of pearly white papules a rim of beaded pearly white papules can be there and on the surface you can see telangiectasia that is uh, dilated blood vessels can be there and of course this can uh, ulcerate this is called as rodent ulcer rodent ulcer okay and this is a site where we can classically see above the line joining the one second am i visible and audible yes uh, students please uh, in the comment section type if i am visible and audible yes or please uh, hit that like button if everything is fine or in the chat section at least give a emoji of like thank you so much uh, del cv for the confirmation okay so this is about basal cell carcinoma next we have acanthosis nigricans where we can see hyperpigmented velvety plaques velvety plaques over the neck and axilla and basically in this patients also the problem is insulin resistance insulin if you remember if you remember uh hyron syndrome hyperandrogenism insulin resistance acanthosis nigricans okay hyron syndrome so in this acanthosis nigricans as you can see velvety plaques will be present over the axilla and the most common causative uh, uh, association is obesity followed by diabetes and even there can be associated malignancies which can uh, cause this which can which can be associated rarely like for example adenocarcinoma like for example adenocarcinoma okay thank you for the confirmation uh, devan singhal thank you so much okay so there is insulin like growth factor which is elevated in these uh, patients blood stream giving rise to this uh, feature and uh, here we have uh, the rapid multiple onset of seborrheic keratosis giving rise to this sign of lesser trilat 
so when an elderly patient comes with a sudden explosion of these seborrheic keratotic lesions this is called as lesser telart sign and we it, we should be very very vigilant about possible gi adenocarcinoma in this patient so we have to get these patients properly investigated for any possible gi adenocarcinoma very important we, because i have seen this happening in my family member so uh, it uh, i take it very personally whenever uh, i see this uh, particular thing okay so now coming to connective tissue disorders and drug reactions so dermatomyositis remember very very important uh, topic so we can this is a condition where skin lesions will be there and along with that muscle involvement in the form of proximal muscle weakness can be seen proximal muscle weakness can be seen and basically we are going to have gotten papules gotten papules violaceous flat topped papules violaceous flat topped papules can be seen over the interphalangeal joint and metacarpophalangeal joints and gotten sign is violaceous macular erythema erythema if uh, there are no papules we call it as gotten sign at the same side we can see this violaceous macular erythema if it is present peri orbitally we call it as heliotrope rash very very important all these names are extremely important and we can see mechanics hands which are hyper keratotic fissuring hyper keratotic fissuring which we can see over the tips and sides of the fingers okay and uh, if it violaceous macular erythema if it is present over the thighs it is called as holster sign it is called as holster sign so a few points uh, regarding uh, ichthyosis vulgaris ichthyosis vulgaris x linked ichthyosis and lamellar ichthyosis okay ichthyosis vulgaris is the most common type of uh, ichthyosis where we can see fish like scaling fish like scaling which are fine white in nature x linked ichthyosis uh, it is also called as ichthyosis nigra it is also called as ichthyosis nigra and lamellar ichthyosis so so please remember in the case of uh, x linked ichthyosis the point which you must remember is it is associated with corneal opacities and cryptostigm so these are the two points associated with x linked ichthyosis and also there is a steroid sulfatase enzyme deficiency that is not so much important but uh, steroid sulfatase deficiency and here it is due to filagrin filagrin mutation whereas lamellar ichthyosis it has few important terms which you must remember dark plate like scales can be seen in this condition and we are going to have what is called as a collodion membrane collodion membrane can be seen in these patients and it is associated with uh, the the uh, ectropion and eclabium i'll show you the images okay one second yeah so this is the collodion membrane which you are able to see collodion membrane which is a parchment like membrane which is present all over the body of the child since birth since birth that is important and it is seen in of course autosomal recessive congenital ichthyosis which uh, we briefly write it as rk so here it is lamellar ichthyosis very very important having collodion membrane since birth it was asked in the uh, one of the questions and harlequin ichthyosis it is a autosomal recessively inherited condition where abca12 gene mutations can be seen so fixed drug eruption so there will be a drug history there will be a drug history like for example it can be even metronidazole which is used in patients who are having diarrhea after which there will be development of a dusky red block dusky red block with erythema around the margins erythema around the margins and why is it called fixed drug eruption because whenever the patient takes the drug there will be development of the eruption at the fixed site where the eruption previously occurred so it is called fixed drug eruption and the lesion will heal with a very bad hyperpigmentation it will be heal with hyperpigmentation okay so let us look at few of the questions and we are going to call it a day so please try to answer this mcq in the uh, comments uh, section or chat section
yes everybody patient visits the outpatient department with satellite skin lesion during examination one hypopigmented lesion and one thickened nerve are observed so you are able to see the blister packs are uh, shown here so this is uh, packet one and this is packet two so which treatment would be most appropriate for this patient this, this is the uh, question please try to answer this so what do you think is th this kind uh, this leprosy which is uh, being uh, addressed according to national leprosy eradication program this falls under So you are able to see one hypopigmented lesion is present and one thickened nerve is present. So this comes under posse bacillary leprosy according to national leprosy eradication program and according to the world health organization in the treatment modality we are going to use three drugs we are going to use three drugs that is dapson rifampicin and clopazamine will be used both in posse as well as multi bacillary leprosy. Yes, very good, uh, Devan single. So answer here is going to be packet two for a period of six months. So this is going to be the treatment in this particular patient who is having posse bacillary leprosy. Okay, I hope it is clear. If you are having any uh, doubts, please put those doubts in the chat section. This is the next question. Please put your answer in the comments. Chemo prophylaxis uh, for leprosy should be given to which of the following persons? Which are the following persons? Yes. So I will give you just five seconds of time and uh, then you are good to go. So if you have answered, if you are marked it as option C, you are absolutely right. Sharing same towels and clothes is actually a controversial concept where chemo prophylaxis is advised by few and not advised by few so we will just keep it in reserve uh, it can be wrong or right so living with a patient with leprosy for more than three months this is definitely a criteria uh, for chemo giving chemo prophylaxis contact of age more than two years this is also one of the criteria for chemo prophylaxis Contact for more than 20 hours per week for more than 3 months. This is also a criteria. So 2, 3, 4 are correct. So option C has all this. Uh, so that is the reason why here option 1 is not selected. Sharing the same clothes and towels. Probably if all of them are correct was the option which was mentioned. Then uh, we can have some thought and we can put that as the answer. But uh, even though this is considered... Uh, as a criteria for the chemoprophylaxis in various uh, other sources it is mentioned that the sharing the same clothes and towels need not be a criteria for chemoprophylaxis so we have to wait and watch for the proper criteria to be released but you we already know that there is uh, there are some conditions where there is no need for any chemoprophylaxis like for example if possible signs of chemoprophylaxis are always uh, already present or the patient is confirmed tuberculosis, uh, tuberculosis patient or if there is any uh, liver or kidney disease and if the patient is a pregnant woman or if the rifampicin is uh, already administered in the last two years okay so this is the next question please try to answer this the patient aged 60 shows lesion as depicted in the image below uh, there are reports uh, the, that he noticed a spider crawling uh, in the area of the lesion what is the most probable diagnosis based on this information what do you think is the answer for this so if you have marked the answer as herpes zoster you are absolutely right you are able to see multiple grouped vesicles present over erythematous base along a dermatome along a dermatome so this is herpes zoster or shingles so this is the next question please try to answer what is the most likely diagnosis for a patient who presents with flaccid bullous lesions affecting both the oral cavity oral cavity and the skin as shown in the prior image and exhibits 
exhibits acantholytic cells on zang smear oh very good del cv devan single and manoj saxena you have marked you have uh, uh, made the correct answer you have marked the right answer so what is the answer for this question so if in case you have marked it as option b from because vulgar so you are absolutely right flaccid bullous lesions oral cavity is also affected please remember so whenever you see these uh, bullous lesions and uh, so you are able to see exhibit acantholytic cells are there so acantholytic cells can be seen in intra epidermal blistering disorder intra epidermal blistering disorder epidermal blistering disorder okay so we can rule out bullous and bigger dermatitis herpetiformis okay so in the, the option a and b please remember flaccid lesions and involvement of oral cavity both can be seen in fembigus vulgaris in fembigus foliaceous uh, most likely vesicles and bulla will not be seen but scaly crust is how the manifestation will be in the fembigus foliaceous and not only that the oral in oral cavity involvement will not be there in fembigus foliaceous so answer is option b here so what is the answer for this question what is the uh, tinea what is the tinea likely affect in the 10 year old boy who presents with patchy hair loss along with black dots in the areas of hair loss yes manoj saks del cv yes you have marked it right very good so black dots are seen this is a endothrix variety endothrix variety of tinea capitis is inflam non inflammatory variety of tinea capitis okay this is the next question patient developed uh, pigmentation on the nose experiencing fever and joint pain which appeared shortly after taking nsaids what would be the most likely diagnosis please remember fever and joint pain was there after which nsaids are taken fever and joint pains could most probably be due to chikungunya because of which there is this hyperpigmentation of the nose which is called as chick sign which is called as chick sign so the answer here is going to be chikungunya topical steroids are most effective in so del cv devan single uh, you have marked uh, a for which question yeah very good d right you have marked it right topical steroids are effective uh, most effective in which of this following disease please put your answer in the chat section yes Answer it as eczema and as dermatitis. So the answer is option B, eczema and as dermatitis. Okay. In the other options, you are able to say dermal atrophy steroids are not used. In fact, steroids are going to produce atrophy. So we have to avoid this. And herpes simplex infection, any kind of viral infection, steroids are not used. They are contraindicated. And rosacea steroids are going to aggravate the rosacea. So b are not going to use it in option a c d or, uh, or d option b is the answer here okay so i hope you have enjoyed this session uh, i hope your confusion is now going towards this clarity and uh, those telugu students uh, okay uh, so i hope you can read this so so we can't call a person as failure if he or she never gives up on their efforts so remember this is a, a good quote from the one of the movie and i uh, hope uh, if this session was helpful please do hit that like button uh, and also to share this channel to your friends and also i will leave the pdf in the description below the link i will provide it in the description mostly i will put it in my telegram group 
you can join my telegram group and channel and also follow me on instagram if you wish to so day one single uh, uh, this session is already there in youtube uh, so it will be available so you can watch it later okay and uh, yes you can subscribe to my youtube channel and uh, most likely i will again come up with one more session uh, with uh, just true or false kind of statements uh, in the entire uh, uh, presentation where you can just uh, see whether the statement is true or false and you can uh, very quickly revise uh, it in the form of one liners okay thank you so much happy learning and uh, bye bye